Hi, I'm Christine. Um, I'm from Social Cops, which is based out of Delhi. Um, just to give you a quick sense of scale before I start, um, we work with about 150 organizations across seven countries, and in the past year, about two billion data points have passed through our platform. But before I really go into that, um, I have had too little sleep and too much coffee, so I would love to start out with a story just to like warm myself up, if that's okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so, Malaysia was in the middle of a nationwide census, and the advanced technology behind the census failed. This advanced technology, it wasn't phones, not tablets, not IoT sensors. The advanced technology powering the census, it was pencils. So, right there. Malaysia flat out ran out of pencils. So, the country went into high alert. So they, whoa, no, 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 oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, the country went into high alert. They commissioned an emergency procurement of 170,000 pencils. And then they had to hire an entire workforce to sharpen pencils so that they could finish their census on time. And that's crazy, but that's not the end of the story, right? When this data actually finally came in, they analyzed it and they found that they had been thinking their population was 60 million people. When the census came in, they found out there were only 51 million people in, Malaya, in, in, Malaya, in Myanmar. Oh my gosh, I've been saying the wrong country. <laughs> <laughs> Too much coffee, I'm so very sorry. Um, so Myanmar, they had been planning for 30 years. Every single budget, every single initiative, they had been planning for 9 million people who just didn't exist, right? So. This sounds like a story from like the early 1900s, running out of pencils, right? But this census actually happened in 2014. 2014 was actually the very same year that Germany used big data to win the FIFA World Cup. Isn't it crazy how big data is used to solve some kinds of problems and not others? Let's go to the next one. More broadly, there are certain industries today, like finance and advertising, where data is being used every single second to solve both important and very trivial problems. But in other worlds, the worlds that really, really matter to people's quality of life, education, infrastructure, employment, crime, all of these worlds, data just isn't used in the same way. Right? These industries are light years behind these modern data-driven tech industries in the same way that Myanmar's census was really light years behind the data techniques being used in Germany's football team. So, Social Cops was founded to really take on this disparity, to use data for the problems that really, really matter. Um, we, oh no, 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 <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, so we empower organizations with all the data and all the insights and all the tools they need to really take on these critical problems, the ones where data is so difficult and where the answer to these problems really matters the most. We do this, we do this through data intelligence, which is really a new way of using big data to attack these really critical problems. So data intelligence starts at the problem, right? It starts with what in the world we're trying to solve. And then here is where people normally ask, well, what data do we have? What data can we actually get our hands on? And the answer usually is not much. So that's not where we go. At this point, we say, what is all the data we need to answer this problem? Not what's possible, but what we really need. Once you figure out that, it's about getting your hands on all that data, no matter what it takes, um, which we do through our platform. After that, you get the data, get the insights you need out of it, and put them in front of the people who can really use those insights to solve big problems. So we have a tech platform to handle this, and it really encompasses every single stage of making a decision through data, all the way from defining your problem and getting all of your data to getting the answer you need. Um, so we usually start on our platform by pulling in all of the data from whatever organization we're working with. Um, so we hook up to whatever services they have going on. We pull in all of their data and merge it and verify it. We match it against data from our internal repository, about 600 public data sources. And then 
there's always gaps when you put all this data together. So we deploy our mobile app to fill in these gaps and collect new data. And the mobile app is really meant for reaching the most remote corners of the world, places where there are no internet, um, being used by people who have never used technology before. That's what we've really built for. Once, whoops, once we do that, we merge all the data, verify it automatically, not using data scientists, and then visualize it. So, um, big picture, we've worked with a whole heck of a lot of companies and organizations, everyone from philanthropic foundations and corporates to small startups and nonprofits. But today I want to talk about one of our big focuses recently, which is government. Um, we work with, hold up, <laughs> we work with every single level of the Indian government, all the way from block level officers to national ministers. And we found that these deployments are some of our most far reaching effective deployments. And so that's actually why I want to talk about them today. I'm going to talk about three of our government case studies and let's see what we can figure out from them. Okie dokie. So let's start with this one. This is with the chief minister's office in Maharashtra. So, um, Maharashtra is a state in Western India and the chief minister is kind of like the CEO. Um, so this project was actually inspired when the chief minister went to New York and he saw the mayor's office had this real time data dashboard with all the data mapped out for New York and he thought this is super cool. So he came back to India and he said, I want this in my state. So he partnered with Social Cops. And his vision was to be able to use real time data from the ground to better target the policies that were actually going on and to spend his budget way more effectively. Because by doing this, he could really accelerate Maharashtra's development. So we built him a real time planning and tracking dashboard so we integrated data from the ground from 14 of Maharashtra's flagship schemes. The 14 schemes that were really affecting people's quality of life the most, the 14 biggest ones that really needed, to, that really needed the government's constant eye on them. So we integrated these into a dashboard so in one place, the chief minister and his top officials could be looking at this dashboard, finding out what's working, what isn't working, and reallocate money and programs to the places that really need them. Um, soon we're going to be adding on benchmarks from the UN and other international organizations of where these metrics really should be. So if the metric, for example, is talking about maternal mortality, then we should not just show where Maharashtra's maternal mortality is, but where it should be and what they can do to get it there. Let's go to the next one. Um, next case study is with someone a bit higher up the government hierarchy. This is the Niti Aayog. For those who don't know, the Niti Aayog is kind of like India's government think tank or planning commission. Um, so the Niti Aayog, um, this, this project came about in 2015 when the prime minister took office. Oh, okay, I'll stay there for a minute. So in 2015, the prime minister took office and one thing he realized was that there was no good way to actually see how well India's ministries were doing, right? And these ministers are spending a ton of money on a ton of programs so we should know if it's actually working. But the problem is these ministries didn't actually set good goals. They didn't really say we need to be meeting this goal or this metric. And when they did, it was kind of fluffy and qualitative and you know, they couldn't tell at the end of the year if they had actually met their goal. So the prime minister said we need to do this more in a more data driven way. So the central government took six months and worked with every single one of India's 89 national ministries to create a set of metrics, a set of measurable quantitative goals that they had to hit within the next four years. So that was a good step, but how do you actually see if people are meeting these? Um, that's where we came in. So we created them a dashboard, again. Um, so the dashboard essentially is a way for the ministries and the NITIO to track how well these metrics are actually doing. Every single quarter, every single ministry has to go in and update their data and say whether they've hit their metric, whether they haven't, and so on. The Niti Aayog then goes on, reviews it, and they actually drop public comments on the side saying, why didn't you hit this? What happened here? You fully missed this. What was this screw up about, right? And so this is a way for every single ministry to see how the other ones are doing and to get a feel for what's working in the government and what's not. And the Niti, Niti Aayog essentially can keep a big eye 
on the entire country. Now that's good, but there's about 800 metrics on there, which is way too many for even the Niti Aoyuk to track. Um, so what we did is we created a second dashboard, which aggregates these metrics at a much higher level. And this is for the Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister's office doesn't care about individual ministries' metrics. What they care about is their big goals. Sorry, next one. So they care about their big goals, which are these right here. So for example, for a goal like energy for all, or power for all, they would pull in information, the, the most important metrics, the most important KPIs from the Ministry of Power, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, the Ministry of Coal, right? They'd take the really important metrics and pull them into here so in one screen they can see how their initiative for giving power to everyone is going. And if it's not going well, they can actually see what ministry is screwing it up, what scheme is messing it up, and really go scold them and make it and fix it. So this initiative is really meant to bring a lot more transparency to the government and make India's ministries way more accountable to the government and to the people whose money they're spending. Okay, last one and then we'll get out of here. Um, so, uh, we partnered up with the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas and their flagship scheme is called Ujwala Yojana, which fundamentally tries to give LPG connections to 50 million women under the poverty line. And LPG connections are propane or liquefied petroleum gas. So this is really important because most women in India use chulhas to cook. And chulhas are these like little clay cook stoves and they're really terrible, right? If you cook on one of those, it's equivalent to smoking 400 cigarettes an hour. So that's not good. <laughs> So this scheme wants to give out LPG connections to women under the poverty line. And arguably, this scheme is one of the fastest executed ones in India's history. Um, in just nine months, the Ujwala Yojana scheme has given out 19 million LPG connections in 13 states. Uh, the scheme has really garnered widespread praise across, across the country. And when the Prime Minister's party won uh, recent state elections at an unprecedented level, he said that he won because of the success of this scheme in the state. So we partnered up with the government on this scheme, and we're doing three big things to really push it forward. So, excuse me. Uh, first thing, why do people use chulhas in the first place? They use them because they just don't have access to a center. Oftentimes the nearest center is 20 kilometers away, and they have to walk there get a cylinder, and carry it back uphill on their head for 20 kilometers. And no one's going to do that. So the government partnered up with three oil marketing companies in India to open up 10,000 new LPG centers across India. And normally these are opened up in cities where there's the biggest market potential. But the government said, no, this time we want to open it um, in places that really are going to affect the people who need it most, the places that are going to have the greatest impact. So we came in to figure out where those places were. Um, thank you. So, cool. So what we did is we really, actually go to the top of that, sorry. So what we did is we started with the data they would normally use to figure out where to put these centers, the oil company's data. And this is about sales and market potential and all that sort of good stuff. And it's a good base, but that's never going to place a center near the people who really, really need it. So we merged that with 600 public data sources on people's income, on geographic features, on roads, on, you know, on demographics, on literacy, everything we could really find to figure out who is below the poverty line and really needs these and where are they. And then on top of that, we put a bunch of de geospatial data. So we put the ge uh, geospatial locations of India's 640,000 villages. Um, and then in addition, the 17,000 distribution centers that already exist. And these locations were collected on our app within a week. So we put all this data into a dashboard, and it's not terribly readable, is it? Um, so over on here, you can actually filter out and weight all the different variables you care about. So you can say, I want to reach the people with low literacy, or I want to reach the people with the lowest income or the highest market potential. Um, so the government could essentially filter out, figure out the best location, and 
with that, they came up with the 10,000 locations for new centers. 4,000 of these have now been approved, and the other 6,000 are currently being, being vetted in the field. Now, having a center is good, but the center receives applications, and then it has to give out connections. And it's really important to make sure this process is flowing really smoothly. Otherwise, the center doesn't mean anything. So we created another dashboard to really track the LPG application process. And this pulls in real-time daily data from all 17,000 distributor centers. And it tracks this process right here. Applications being received, cleared, a voucher being issued, and a connection being installed. If you want to scroll down just a bit. So this is one view of it. It looks more or less like this. And it just uses the stoplight colors to show what's working and what isn't working. And the union minister for the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas actually uses this dashboard every single morning on his iPad. And so he looks at it and gets a big picture of the top level views. <coughs> How many applications are, they, are coming in? Are they actually getting processed? Are we giving connections? And then with this, he can really see the breakdowns in the process. So for example, next one. So for example, in this one right here, reasons for rejection. At one point, he noticed that lots of women were getting rejected because they didn't have a bank account. Excuse me, which is actually mandatory for the scheme. You have to have a bank account connected to your LPG connection. And this is a really big problem. So he said immediately, why don't we just carry out Yandan Yojana camps in the regions where this is a problem? Yandan Yojana is another, another government scheme that gives bank accounts to people. So he called up the relevant state ministers, got them to carry out bank account, uh, these bank account camps, and now that has actually gone way down. The number of women being rejected due to lack of a bank account is nearly zero. Um, he's found other policy changes because of this dashboard, and it's actually the previous screen where there were all those greens and reds. It used to be mostly red, and now it's mostly green. It's getting there. Last step. Uh, Cool, so we open centers, and then we track how well the centers are doing. The last step is actually getting a connection in people's houses. And this is good, you can just go give them a cylinder and say goodbye, but there's more to it, right? Cylinders, these LPG connections are inherently dangerous, right? It's gas coming out of a stove and then you're lighting it on fire. So it's really important that these connections are installed safely. So one thing we've done is equipped every single one of India's mechanics with our app, and as they go and install every new connection, they collect data on how that connection is installed, and they take before and after photos to show that it's being installed safely. So then we pulled all the after photos into a dashboard that just scrolls and shows all the photos as they come in. And the very first time we showed this dashboard to the ministers, they actually just sat there for like 15 minutes watching these photos scroll by. Um, and they thought it was so interesting because they could immediately see problems that we had never anticipated, right? So they would see it scroll by and they'd say, oh, field, table. Like, they'd see these photos of things that were clearly not LPG connections. And these are cheating mechanics who just don't bother to do their work. So they could immediately click on the photo, see where it's coming from, call up the distribution center and say, your mechanic is screwing up, fix it. Within days, these mechanics started submitting real data. Um, they sometimes would look at this and see a connection being installed right under a really low straw roof, which is a bad idea. So they would call up the distribution center and say, send your mechanic back and move it to a safe place. Um, one other thing they saw was that a lot of women were installing these stoves on the ground. So they called up the distribution centers and asked why. And they found out that in a lot of these really poor households, women don't even have a table or any sort of surface to put the stove on. And that's actually really important. The stove should be above the height of the cylinder for safety. So now they're working on a policy to give out free stone tables along with every new LPG connection. So <coughs> just at a broad view, one thing we've talked about today is starting with the change you want to drive and then getting all the data to figure that out. This is actually a case of the opposite. When we started this program, we never could have anticipated that the biggest policy changes were $2 stone tables and connecting an LPG scheme with a banking scheme. So when you actually go the reverse, when you start with all of your data and you pull it all together, and then organically find the problems out of that, sometimes you're gonna come up with a really interesting change that's gonna drive really interesting policy changes. So 
Um, in the last three years, we've been really lucky to work with a lot of really amazing organizations, not just government, but all sorts of companies and startups and nonprofits across everything from maternal mortality and women's safety to disaster relief. And one of our biggest takeaways has been this. Most decisions today, especially the ones that are most important in improving the world and addressing our most critical problems, these decisions are made on too little data. And this is understandable, like I'm not gonna judge anyone. But if we can actually unify all the data we need, then we can do really amazing things to take on some of these really critical problems in the world. Um, I'd love to speak about, if you have any questions, now or after. This is three of about 40 projects we have going on. So come talk to me separately if you're curious about anything.